Rogers is from IUPUI, which is uh, associated with Purdue University and the Fusion Studio, and he's going to be sharing developing soft skills with interdisciplinary teams in the first year and some lessons learned in his scholarly work. So Christian, come on up and let's give him a round of applause. This is my presentation. We're still doing this. <laughs> Move up, move down. And so that's the easiest way to say it. I'm on the Purdue side, uh, and so, but when I need a paycheck, I have to go to the IU side. So that's kind of how that, that works. So um, we also are a part of the Fusion Studio as well, and so we're proud to be one of the consortium members. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, soft skills. Um, and in fact, I, I'm kicking myself because the idea of using the word soft skills, I think, is actually a bad term. I actually should have said EQ, um, or emotional intelligence, because at the end of the day, they're not at all soft. Uh, they really aren't. Uh, and I'm a, a big believer in this reality that we have to, at a young age, begin to develop these skills over time to help create well-rounded human beings. And I, you know, I've been in higher education for about 15 years, and you know, essentially when, you, when you're in higher education, this is kind of how it functions. Right? So students might go through a common first year experience. They go through that first year experience. Uh, maybe they're exploratory. Maybe they go into a pre-college pre program, and then they go into a, a major and then a more specific discipline. Uh, and so this is kind of how it works. Granted, this is somewhat rudimentary. But, but I'm just curious, what, what could be kind of some of the flaws with this model? And this is the interactive portion of my presentation. So I'm going to ask you, what? What do you think about this? I mean, we're all in academia, whether you're a grad student, whether you're faculty. Oh, I just got a thumbs down. Why? Silos. Silos, right? Um, I mean, that is the reality, is there are a lot of silos that take place. And I, I should have put a picture of a choir up here, because I feel like that's what I'm doing, is I'm preaching the choir. Because the reality is, is we want to see more of this. We want to see more of the collaboration that actually takes place between these different disciplines. We want to see more collaboration that takes place between uh, you know, an engineer and an artist working together. And so, if you haven't figured this out about me already, but in, first of all, how many of you have been on the Kingdoms Runaway Railway? Okay, for those of you that have been on, you'll get this, right? So I kind of feel like this is it right here. You know, that's, that's me, and that's my dean and my chair, and then, you know, if you've been on the run, you know all hell breaks loose after a few minutes, and the dean and the chair are not happy. And honestly, I'm actually very well supported by my dean and my chair. I do love them dearly. Uh, and they let me do all kinds of crazy things. But um, my university has made attempts to, uh, to, to create this culture of collaboration, of innovation, of creativity. 
Uh, about three years ago, they developed something called the Profiles of Undergraduate Learning. And what that basically means is when a university comes to IUP, or a student comes to IUPUI, they are presented with these profiles and said, this is essentially the, the person or the type of people that we want to be. Uh, innovator, collaborator, or community contributor, problem solver, and communicator. And this is, they adopted this, and, and yet, I, I will say this, they didn't really do an excellent job of figuring out what this actually means for the end course, for the end instructor. Uh, it's done in pockets, but not necessarily overall. I started out teaching in class in our bridge program. Bridge is an experience that students go through before their first day of class. It's over a period of five days. Lots of uh, universities have these first year experiences. So I taught a specific sections of this in innovation and creativity. So I wear two hats with the university, along with directing my program, teaching courses in themed entertainment and motion design. I also run student innovation for the campus. So um, I received a grant, and the director of first year programs and myself developed something called the JAG Challenge. And what the JAG Challenge actually is, is that an instructor in a bridged course will take their class and break them up into teams of three. And when they take them up and they break them into teams of three, they will uh, provide them with a what we call a challenge space. So I'm actually going to bolt ahead here. So these, uh, the four challenge spaces we actually did this past year, the first one was creating a welcoming space on campus. We specifically focused on diversity this year. And I gave the students some keywords, uh, and, and I did this in a kickoff session with all of our sections. Uh, and so here are the key, here are the challenge spaces, here are the key words attached to those challenge spaces, and that's it. I didn't give them anything else. Uh, so that was the first challenge space. The second one was on global engagement, and I gave them some key words around that, global citizenship, study abroad, learning about other cultures, uh, promoting health and wellness, so making people feel safe, making people feel um, uh, masking healthcare and mental, mental wellness, Sustainability, energy reduction was the third challenge space, greener living, renewable energy, uh, and that, yeah, that was the fourth challenge space. So what we did is, uh, the first year we did this, we had eight sections that went through this. The second year we had 18 sections that went through this, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. And on that first day, I had everybody in a, in a lecture room, and we gave them these challenge spaces. Teams got to pick those which challenge spaces they were going to go with, and they followed a schedule. Along with everything else they had to do during the week of bridge, we had them um, do things specific to the JAG challenge. So the first day was the big introduction with me. They also walked on a campus having already completed a personality assessment. They get together with their teams, they meet each other, uh, they talk about what they learned from that assessment, and we do the big kickoff with me. Uh, and then what they did is once they figured out what that challenge space was, they immediately had to go interview somebody else. So they had to figure out what are the pain points in this challenge space. So if I want to create a more welcoming space at IPUI, what are the, the, what are the pain points that people have to have with that? They go and they interview someone that evening outside of their group. They have some, they, they have some familiar with the university and they have some familiar, familiarity with the challenge space. The next day, we had them come back, and as a team, what they would do is they would uh, talk about what they learned, pick one person that they had interviewed, and they create what's called an empathy map. How many of you have ever created an empathy map before? A few, oh, a few, Lori has. So, there you go, a few. So an empathy map is basically a way to develop a profile of an individual, to basically say, okay, here's a problem we're looking at, this is the type of individual that would experience this problem. Uh, because you realize once you've created a solution for one type of person, you've actually created it for many. Uh, lots of businesses do this in different forms and functions. Uh, it's a part of the, the customer discovery process and businesses. Uh, it might be called something different, but a, it's a lot, of, a lot of similarity. So they created an empathy map, and then we have an ideation session, and everything is timed. So what we do is we actually have videos that we created, 
a module that they download and bring into their learning management system. So the ideation session that they go through is a tiny 25 minute activity. What they then do is they, uh, they will down all their ideas down to three and they go, to, they go back to the person they originally interviewed. They go back there, they ask them their opinion on those three possible solutions. So they'll go over you know, to, to Peter or to somebody else and say, okay, you, know, you, you gave us these pain points. This is the one we're gonna go with. Here's the possible solutions. Can you give me some feedback on that? Day three, they, uh, they put together a presentation and prototype after whittling it down to one final solution. So they put that together again. They only have so much time to do that. And then what they do is they present it on that Friday with an innovation showcase. And so the first year we did this, we had about 75 teams in the room, uh, and they present all different types of, you know, all different types of solutions to the different challenge spaces that we've given them. Uh, we got, the second year, we actually obviously moved, like everybody else, into an online format. And so that's why we actually had more sections. Uh, and so we did everything via Zoom, and we did an online showcase. So each section ended up nominating their top presentation, and that went forward to a main showcase because we couldn't have 75 presentations on Zoom. My head might fall off. Um, and then this past year, we had about 87 teams. So we're cycling through, I think I had about 357 students that have, that have gone through. So um, with the showcases, we have judges. And so these judges are connected with specific offices. So for example, you know, if one of those challenge spaces being sustainability, we have someone from our office of sustainability serve as a judge to give recommendations on those best presentations that can go forward. And I'm actually proud to, to say that one of these solutions that was presented at this year's showcase, what they did was they, uh, the Office of Sustainability liked it so much, they went and got a grant for it. And it's actually gonna happen this spring. So students, before they even walked onto campus for their first day of the semester, were already contributing to the larger community that they went through. So these are the numbers that people went through for the, the numbers of students that have gone through over the years. We're actually looking to expand it to every student at IUPUI. That's eventually the, the possibility of where we're going. Um, my, my director of first year experience is now trying to convince me to do that. So uh, the, the special thing about this, going back to my original point, is I don't just have one thread of student that serves on a team, right? So these are exploratory students from all different walks of life. In my specific class, I have, a, I have nursing students, I have business students, I have education students, and they're broken up into multidisciplinary teams to work on wicked solutions to wicked problems. And so some of the things that have come out of this is that they have, um, they have obviously learned what is the process of creating in a multidisciplinary team. For someone that's working on a more welcoming space on the campus, they might not even necessarily know what they want to do for their, for their career or even their college uh, major. They're already starting to figure how to work together as a team, how to communicate with another, one another, how to present that possible solution in public and do so to a judge. They also learn about empathy. That's the first thing we've started to learn. We've just now started to go through those reflections. Students are learning, how do I solve a problem from somebody else's perspective, right? So they're not just thinking, oh, the solution up in their own head. They're having to go and talk to somebody else. There's some ambiguity here, right? So we don't give them a lot of information because, uh, you know, not to pick on K-12 education, but a lot of times they are taught to the test. Uh, they are prescribed the specific criteria to follow. They are given a very small box to play in. What we do is we just say health and wellness, go figure it out. Maybe I'm not that that, mean. but but pretty damn close. They have to go do the research. They have to go figure out what does that actually mean for our campus. Um, they also have to do with this idea of faith of fear, and that's a lot of times what ties in with the ambiguity. If I don't really know what's going on here. I'm afraid I might fail. And so, I don't know how many of you are faculty who teach, in under, uh, teach undergrad students, 
but I can tell you right now, the types of students that we are seeing come into the university now deal and uh, deal with failure, failure now more than ever, right? Mental health is a major issue. The types of students that we have coming in, um, our, our uh, counseling center on campus has seen triple enrollment, right? Triple the number of cases. And it's because students are really struggling with multiple things, and one of them being failure. I was talking with a colleague the other day, and they said, you know, when I was a kid, I would tinker and I would play, and I would do the same. I was making videos, and I was making 3D animations when I was in middle school. I don't think we're seeing that as much as possible, as, as often. A lot of students are sitting on their devices, they're gaming. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. Gaming can actually be a really good thing, but it's interesting to me how many students come to our program and go, I want to be a gamer. Well, why? Because I love to play video games. But they really have no idea how to get, get from point A to point B. The other thing too, this is a great project-based project learning activity. So my background is in visual communications and instructional design. Project-based learning is important. Um, also, this provides a lot of opportunity for students to reflect on their experience and reflect on the five days. We don't expect them to develop innovative ideas that are always necessarily feasible. Um, as instructors, we do our best to try to make it as innovative and as feasible as possible, right? So if I have a student coming up with, okay, we need to make the campus safer, but we're just gonna put up more blue lights on campus. That's not necessarily a, uh, an innovative solution, right? But as instructors, it's our opportunity to guide them in a specific direction. So I do training with all of our new instructors that actually implement the Jack Challenge in their classroom. Uh, this is one of the things I hit on immensely. What am I doing going forward? So obviously the Jack Challenge is continuing to grow. Uh, we're also in the process right now of uh, categorizing uh, the actual reflections because we have all the students go through those reflections or actually do complete a reflection So we're in that process right now But I've also been awarded a grant this past summer to look at multidisciplinary teams and how they function in the industry So I'm going to be traveling come to a couple different locations in the United States and And looking at how does the artist and the engineer play together? How does the designer and developer play together? How do they create? How do they solve problems? How do they deal with team conflict? And then we're gonna be bringing that back into the classroom. Uh, and so stay tuned for more on that later. The other thing that I'm excited is, to do is, um, I've partnered with Denise Chapman Weston. Denise is a prolific innovator within the field of entertainment. Uh, she owns a company called Infinite Kingdoms, and she actually came to me about two months ago. Uh, she found me on LinkedIn, and she said, hey, I saw a post that you liked. Uh, can we play together? Can we work together? Uh, and she asked me, she said, you know, I, I, I see people at universities, you know, I've seen my son at the university, and I've said, you know, is there a place where there's different disciplines coming together, where they're inventing and they're creating, uh, and they're doing so in a multidisciplinary environment? I said, it's not common, but you're speaking my language. So we started to develop a, a pilot course, this is what we're gonna be doing this spring with about 15 students at IPUI. And she's brought in a slew of really awesome uh, industry connections that we're gonna be having piped into our classroom. Uh, and they're gonna be serving as users and mentors to our students as they learn how to invent, uh, as they also witness invention take place uh, that Denise is doing. Uh, so we're gonna make them sign NDAs. Uh, they're gonna go through that process and they're gonna learn about it from beginning to end. So um, we're gonna be collecting information on that as well. So this is, this is me, uh, this is my focus on multidisciplinary learning. Uh, and I think it's something that can help save higher education. In a lot of ways, higher education is really struggling. It just is. Um, to, uh, you know, tuition's high, enrollment's down, uh, and, and yet people play in silos. And I'm thinking this is one key opportunity for a university. They've got all of these different uh, schools of thought and all these different disciplines. How can they work together to create amazing solutions, uh, specifically in the entertainment industry, but also beyond. So that's my info. You can hit my QR code right there, and, and thank you for your time. I'll take any questions you might have.
as far as your effort is going to be to figure out ways of extending it through the curriculum so that they finish with this? Because, I mean, graduate school can be a place where yeah. this actually happens in a very different way. We're experts in their undergraduate you know, career come together and work with them. That, that's a really good question, Stephen. You, you know, it, first of all, I'm limited, right? Because one, there's only one of me, but also I have to play and work with the other people at the university. Um, thankfully, the work that I do as a faculty fellow is within the Institute for Engaged Learning, which is a centralized unit on campus. And so um, I would actually, in some ways, I say I inherited the, the um, I inherited the, uh, the pitch competition for the university. So we're figuring how to rethink that to make it part of capstones. I am also um, in the process of co-developing a minor in, in, in innovation for all students at IUPUI. And so, um, so yes, this is a five-day experience. Actually, I didn't mention that during the pandemic, we pivoted and made it a 10-week experience during the fall um, because Bridge was so different. And so, I, I mean, this is the first time that we've seen those profiles actually be actionable things. Um, and I'm hoping that um, it catches fire within the university and, and more people pick up on it. Any other questions for Christian? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you.